Uh, I want Charles to leave me in the key of G here. Give me the key of G. And uh, here's a song that we used to sing a lot. Uh, I used to have these uh, gospel singings. We'd have the old, uh, uh, instead of the main hymn hymnal, we would have the old paperback hymnal. Uh, Grady Nutt used to call it the Route 4 hymnal there for the little rural churches. And we'd sing a lot of little gospel songs. And here's one that we do. Give me the key of G there. <laughs> I am just a weary pilgrim walking through this world of sin, getting ready for that mansion when the saints go marching in. If you know it, sing this part. When the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in that chorus again. When the saints go marching in. When the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. All right. And today we're going to talk about who are the saints. If you'd open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians the first chapter, and we're going to do something very different today. I'm glad for these young people to be here. I challenged them. I, I sort of, kids, I pushed for your dad to bring you today. Okay, I did. So <laughs> I said, hey, I called because I want to do something. That's, it's not just geared to you, but I think it will encourage you today. And so we want you to come be part of that. And I'm going to do something very different. This is not a normal expositional sermon that I would preach. Where I, I am going to look at, we are going to have some exposition. We are going to look at the the first two verses of 2 Corinthians, I hope I told you about 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We will read this passage, we will go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to uh, dig into the scripture, but then we're also going to look at some illustrations of people who are saints of God, and we're going to see how that applies to all of us. So I'll give you a moment to get there, and it's also on the screen there in the Christian Standard Bible version. Uh, who is a saint? Let's look at verses 1 and 2 of 2 Corinthians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this group who is here today. Of various ages, we're reminded that your church is made up of people uh, young and old, that uh, you save people at a very young age, and Lord, you even bring people to you at a very uh, advanced age, and we're thankful for these. Some in here today, we know we're saved at a young age and have walked with you for many years. We're thankful for young, old, and all in between, Lord, how you've brought us here to worship you, to carry out the work of your kingdom to minister in your name. So, Lord, I just pray for your anointing to be upon me as I share your word. We're thankful for the great time of discussion we had concerning the book of Isaiah as we met uh, Brother Harry led us in that great time of study. Uh, we're thankful that we can come and sing praises as Charles and Lorinda have, have led us, Lord, in these great hymns of faith uh, that speak of wonderful Christian doctrine of what you did for us on the cross, songs that speak of surrender, uh, we all thank you that we were able to give uh, offering and tithes to you today. And Lord, we lift up to you those who are sick and afflicted. I, I'm thankful for my friend Steve recovering, but he still needs your touch and your help. We, we are beginning to see COVID crank back up again, and, and we would pray that you would stop it, that you would bring it uh, down, and that you would help us to find the right balance between mitigating it and yet at the same time not totally shutting down our society. Uh, Lord, we know that the greatest need we have in America is to repent and turn to you. And Lord, I'm disappointed that so many people have failed to cry out to you in the midst of this crisis. Uh, you're trying to tell us something, Lord, and I'm afraid so many aren't listening. Lord, would you help us to listen and hear what you're doing in our world today? As the election comes up, Lord, we pray that you give people wisdom as to how to vote. We would pray that no matter what the outcome, there would not be any violence, Lord, that you would protect your people. And that uh, we as Christian people would promote uh, your love, your message, your gospel. Help us today to understand what it means to be a saint of God and to live for you, Lord. 
And we'll give you the credit, the praise, the honor, the glory. For we all pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So now, if you will look at to take your outline out. And we're going to talk about who are the saints. Uh, some people would say that they're a professional football team from New Orleans, Louisiana. And... Uh, <laughs> And they've been around, basically, as uh, I found out that Charles and I are the same age. They've been around since we've been alive, okay? New Orleans Saints have been there. Some people would say that a saint is a super Christian who has excelled far beyond ordinary Christians, okay? These super Christians have memorized large chunks of Scripture, which is a good thing to do. Uh, they demonstrate an extremely high moral standard, which Christians should do. They volunteer at church and in the community, which Christians should do. Uh, they display unbelievable amounts of patience and mercy, or they're extra brave, and they boldly speak out against great wickedness. Maybe they even give large sums of money to the work of God. And lastly, they're, they're probably powerfully skilled in sharing the gospel, maybe winning many people to Jesus. And those are things that saints should do. Okay, those are things we should all do. Well, I'm saying it is true that there is a team in New Orleans called the Saints, but we're not talking about them today. Okay, that's right. And uh, we're talking about a group of Christians. But Saints are not super Christians who live high above everyone else. As you'll see here in your outline on point number one, in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, in 2 Corinthians 1, I'm sorry, verse 2, the Saints are those who have received and experienced the grace of God. That's what a saint is. A saint is someone who has come in contact with the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Secondly, they are the called out ones. They are members of God's church. They are people that God has called out. We talked last week about sanctification and how God has sanctified his people and set them apart. So we are set apart. We talked last week about my strict holiness upbringing and how at that time, the women didn't wear makeup and, you know, they didn't wear, uh, you know, slacks or anything like that. We had some really tough dress codes and they were really tougher on the ladies than they were the men. And uh, really, a lot of it was unfair. Uh, but really, in, in the end, uh, that's not what we're talking about. We are different, but it's, uh, it's my a pastor that I served with some years back, the one I served with when I was in Florida. He liked to quote uh, John uh, R.W. Stott. And I like Dr. Stott. Dr. Stott passed away a few years ago. He was nearly 90 years of age. Dr. Stott uh, was a, man, a very wise man, but he also loved the younger people. And he would, I remember when the emergent church movement came along, there was a group called the Emerging Church. They were not the emergent church, but they were emerging. And there were young people starting to question some things about practices and churches and how we're doing things. And Dr. Stott didn't immediately blast those young ministers. He said, let's listen to them. Let's hear. They're asking good questions. Now, some of that later led into some liberalism and some things that weren't good in the emergent church. But while we were still figuring out what that was, he was very compassionate about that. And John R. W. Scott had a statement about Christianity when he said we, we are called to a holy worldliness. That, that sounds sort of weird, doesn't it? A holy worldliness? Doesn't that sound against one another? A holy and worldly? Well, the point is that we are out in the world. Brother Harry talks about that a lot in Sunday school where he mentions that the, as we share the gospel with people, we're to use things that people understand and to which they relate. So he was saying today, even in the Facebook world, instead of totally pulling out, we need to be connected with it still. We might not like all that we see there. I'm tempted to get off of social media too, but even on my, my Twitter post, I tend to relate to a lot of people who've been abused by church and the people that have even been sexually abused uh, and mentally and emotionally abused. And I have found a great ministry there and a great way to uh, encourage people and help correct some things. Sometimes people who have been abused or had a bad experience, they sort of throw out as the old proverbial saying, the baby with the bathwater. And I try to encourage them, oh, don't do that. Don't totally give up on the church, but give up on the bad churches. Give up on the ones that aren't doing well. But God still has his people. But, so there's a holy worldliness. We're aware of what's going on in the world. Like, I don't know, we, we, today we're singing hymns and classic gospel songs. But, you know, the, some of the songs I listened to this week, everything I listened to this week wasn't a hymn. I listened to some classical music. 
uh, I listened uh, to some country music. Uh, I, I just had a friend of mine send me, I bought a CD up from his, he, he's a, a worship pastor, but he uh, recorded a, a country music CD, and I bought it. Great, great job. He did an excellent job. I was edified listening to those songs. Uh, you can listen to a beautiful love song. Well, God's the author of love and beauty, and um, you need to take time to, to look at beautiful paintings and listen to beautiful music and relax and nourish your mind through these things. Read be- books about beauty and things that, are, that nourish your mind. Uh, they don't always have to be the Bible, even though it's very important to read the Bible. So you need to know about the world, but, but you're in the world, but you're not of it. You don't live by their value system. So saints are people that don't live by the value system of the world. So young people, you can enjoy a lot. Everything is not bad that's in the world. Like the holiness group I grew up in, ours was not as strict. There were some more strict than us. They believed it was sinful to go to ball games or to wear neckties. You know, a lot of people, I guess, believe it's simple to wear neckties. They don't wear them anymore, but, you know, and you don't have to, like you say, you can dress casually in this church. I just choose to dress up a little more because, well, I think it makes me look better, okay? So, so that gives you something better to look at. The other part is I spent a lot of money on these clothes, and I figure, you know, yeah, use them. I'm getting ready to get in possibly the insurance business, and I realize it's just good to dress up a little bit, even uh I've discovered working from home like I've been doing that it's just good to get up and not stay in your pajamas all day. It just helps to, a few weeks ago I was interviewing online and it was just good to put on a, I even had to put on a tie, you know, and, uh, uh, and do some things there, you know, and uh, it, it, it's to change my mindset, really. It's almost, it's like, the, like a soldier going out to fight. You know, he didn't go out to fight in tennis shoes and blue jeans. He puts on the, the armor that he's supposed to put on and he's ready to go fight. Well, that's me. I dress up a little bit, and I'm ready to go. Ready to go attack what I need to attack and go do what I need to do. So, But we are the called out ones. We're in the world, but we've been called out to represent the Lord. So we don't live just like the world. So it, it's, and I'm not saying that we should totally dress like the world. or we, we certainly should have some distinction. But a lot of it is the way we act and treat people. Will be. I had, a, I had a great testimony. A friend of mine was out of church for a while, and uh, this, this friend had, had told me, she said, well, my husband was so sick, I was looking at your Facebook post, and, you know, I try to post uh, devotional readings and other things, and or pictures of our dog, as you know, Jenna Beth last night decided that she thought it was a great idea to put a toboggan on the dog, and uh, he, he tolerated that for a little bit, but <laughs> she tried it again, and he actually took his nose and booped her in the eye, he's like, don't, don't do that no more, <laughs> you know, he, he's not one to bite, but he's like, I don't like that, you know, okay, stop it, you know, so... He did that to me the other day. I was slinging him around in the back seat. I had him in my old car, and, and he come and boot me, you know, in the back of his, his nose, in the back of my shoulder, like, stop it. Quit, quit driving so crazy. So, uh, yeah, so he's, yeah, he's got a little personality. But, but, yeah, but we're called out ones. We're members of the church, but we're, not, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of it. So, so I would say here in point number three that the saints are all of God's people, all of them. Those who have matured in the walk with God, and who live consistently a holy life, as well as those who have trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, but who seem to have more down days than up. John Gill, there's a quote here, the great uh, preacher of uh, many years ago says of the saints, the saints themselves are the Lord's portion and the lot of his inheritance and whom he is and who and will be abundantly glorified. So the saints of the Lord's portion, he is, they are God's people. So you may be a saint that's struggling today and you say, Man, I'm not all I ought to be. And I want to be better. Well, you, you, you belong to the Lord. You're his portion. You're the lot of his inheritance. Uh, he is in your life. And he's going to be abundantly glorified by you. So don't give up and don't quit because you haven't arrived yet. A classic gospel song put it this way. It says, I know I'm not the man I ought to be. And you could say a lady too. But I thank God I'm not the man I used to be. And I'm growing. So being a saint of God is not just this super saint that lived before. That, and by the way, there's, just, there's denominations. Today is All Saints Day, by the way. Uh, Catholics, uh, Episcopalians, Lutherans, some Methodists observe it. Uh, we know as Baptists don't tend to do that. But I've started making All Saints Day's post on uh, Facebook. And I'm going to share with you some saints that have impacted me here in just a minute uh, in a great way. Uh, no, we're not praying to these saints. That's not what we're doing. The Catholics sometimes do that. The Episcopalians and Lutherans do not do that. 
I think it is good to have heroes. I mean, how many of y'all have read books, you kids, that, that like sports? How many of you read sports books about sports heroes? I, I did all the time. What about, I mean, you read biographies of other people that were great? A lot of us have done that, haven't we? What about about missionaries or about other great Christian leaders? We've done that. They've inspired you, right? Nothing wrong with that. But just know that the same God that saved them saved you too. Okay? And, and so don't read them and be encouraged to, to strive for what God did in their life. But don't read it and say, well, I'll never be that. No, 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 don't, don't have that attitude at all. So, so we want to say that the church at Corinth, where this, this, this uh, book was written, it was 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, that was a church that had many problems. It was far from perfect. But there were many good things happening in the church. There was some great preaching. The spiritual gifts were in operation and were thriving. The church had gifted leaders. But there were also great weaknesses in the church. There were factions. The people followed certain gifted leaders more than they followed the Lord. Has that ever happened in the church? Yeah. I've been in a church with multiple staff members. There was some people some people like me better than the pastor. Some like the pastor better than everybody else. Some like the other staff member better than others. And they would all go to us when they wanted something. And it's it's beautiful when a staff I served in one church when I served back in Florida. We had a great system of uh, pastors and elders and uh, it was the best run church I've ever been in as part of, as far as that goes cuz we were all a unit. You know, people would come to us. We would listen to what they said, but we all acted as a unit. It was never, you know, we all would meet together once a month, the elders would, and we would listen to, you know, we'd bring up what people had shared. And, but at the end of the day, we, we, we jointly made a decision. And it's easy to hate one leader, but sometimes when all six or eight have said something, it's like, well, I really like that guy. I guess if he went along with it, I guess it's okay. We, we found it really stopped a lot of, a lot of problems there, but... But, but it happens, you know, there was path actions in this church. Uh, they were, the rich were not always sharing with the poor. This happened in the Lord's Supper. They didn't just, I mean, they did commemorate the Lord's Supper like we did, but they also had a big meal. And sometimes the rich were eating and because they consumed wine in that day with a meal, some were eating to the point they got drunk. They were drinking and the poor were being left out. And that was not good. There was even some sexual immorality taking place in that church. So sometimes we get discouraged about the church today not being all it ought to be, but God's not giving up on it. We, I mean, we need, to, we need to correct things. We need to, as I've told you a, a, a few weeks back, I had a loved one that was abused by a minister. So that's a big issue with me. I don't tolerate abuse. You know, Brother Mike, what's going to happen if somebody else comes to you and reports abuse in this church? I'm calling the cops. You know, I mean, somebody's, I mean, we're going we're to let them examine this. We're not going to, yeah, there's a crime's been committed and, and we've got to do something, you know. Uh, too many times God's judging churches now because many big ministries covered up stuff. And that's not right. But, but, but we don't need to give up either and totally just, just quit. So that church had problems. And I've told people, I, I don't think we're a Corinthian church, but if we were, I don't think I'd be afraid to pastor you because God was at work in that church. There were good things happening. Amen. Paul had to rebuke them about a lot of things, but he didn't give up on them. So we have to be careful. Sometimes, you know, Francis Schaeffer said this some years ago about marriage and things. He said some people, I, I told you this a few weeks back, uh, can't have a perfect marriage, so I just won't have one at all. So people leave their marriage. It's like, I've been married, you know, nearly 30 years. It hadn't been a perfect marriage, but I'm glad we stuck it out because it's a, it's a lot better now. There were some seasons I thought, wow, man, this is not a lot of fun, you know, and I know she thought that too. Uh, sometimes it wasn't a lot of fun because of the sin in my own heart, okay? It was more me than it was her. But I thought it was her. You know, she probably thought it was. She probably thought it was me too. Okay, that's right. Okay, so and it was okay in a lot of ways. It was, and I had to learn to grow, even though I was a minister. So, um, but but I do want to say in point number four here, even with all the failings and strugglings experienced by the Corinthian believers, the apostle referred to them as what? Saints. They were saints. You know. You know even. Our football team, the New Orleans Saints. The guy that's on the practice team that's not even good enough to make the regular team, he's still a saint. You know that? Mm -hmm. They still pay him a salary. You know, he's still on the team. So you may be a struggling Christian today, but you are a saint. And then he also said in point number five that they were the holy ones and then dealt with all their moral and spiritual problems. He didn't say, get your moral and spiritual problems fixed and then you can be a saint. 
He said, you're saints. Now because you're saints, here's how you live. And then he goes and he corrects a lot of things and straightens out those things. So as I said earlier, in the liturgical church calendar today is All Saints Day. It was a holy day created to offset All Hallows Eve or Halloween. And it's a day that is to remember those who went before us and lived exemplary lives for us to imitate. And I will say there's a, a popular, well, my, my daughter, who's at Baylor, the one I showed you up here on the screen, she was pointing out that, yeah, in these denominations, they wait sometimes hundreds of years to really emulate somebody as a saint because a lot of times after somebody dies, we find out some stuff about them that we didn't know they had done. And we're not sure we want to emulate all that. There's a popular Bible teacher that I'm really disappointed in, and I will not emulate him anymore, even though he's still a hero to many, uh, because he supposedly did something sexually he shouldn't have done. But, but, that, but the biggest problem, the reason I'm able to believe some of the bad sexual stuff he did, is because he lied about his credentials. I thought, why would you want to lie about your, your degrees and things? I mean, somebody's eventually going to find that out. And there were people years ago had told this I would say brother. I think he might be a brother that had a lot of flaws. Uh, not to do that. So uh, now if he was truly saved, he didn't quit being a saint, but he's not one we want to emulate, okay? So we have to be careful about that. But it is good to emulate people. We're going to talk about that. To, uh, but number six says it can be encouraging and helpful to look to the past and see those who went before us. We want to do that. Number seven, while the saints are often given as examples for us to honor and follow, often portrayed as super-Christians, they were human beings just as we all are. And this last point on your, and by the sermon, it's not quite over yet. You said, we're already to number eight, okay? But number eight, they had to learn to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They did. The best of them, St. Augustine that we mentioned a, little while, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher that I quote often, you know that there was somebody in his big church building back in the 1800s did a horrible thing. They yelled, fire! And there was a stampede. And some people got killed. And he heard the people screaming as they were trying to get out of the building. He never got over that. He struggled with depression off and on. And back then, he didn't, you know, he didn't have Zoloft or something to take to help him with that. He struggled. And yet God used him mightily. So he was a man of God that had a weakness, an infirmity. But God used him. So he, he, even he had to learn to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So today I'm going to share with you, and this is the reason I wanted some of our young people to come, because I'm going to do something a little differently today. I want to share with you some examples of saints of God who have impacted my life. <laughs> then I have two surprises at the end of the message that I hope will encourage not only the youth, but will encourage all of us. This lady here is, you said that's Joan Scott, but no, it's pronounced Joanne. I don't know why they spell Joanne that way. But Joanne Scott, she was a lady that's, I served with when I was in Greenville, Mississippi. She powerfully influenced my life. She had a passion for missions and was always telling other people about Jesus. When her husband Ray passed away, uh, some of the men from the church went to the hospital to comfort her. Uh, and we asked her, and by the way, Ray passed away. He had been a little bit ill, but he had gone and played 18 holes of golf and played, he said, the best he had in years. He played the 18th hole and died on the fairway. He did. He passed away, I think, in the, in the golf cart. And uh, we, we went to the hospital to try to comfort her. We asked her, how could we help? Here was her answer. I'll be all right, but there are people in the ER who are hurting and need Jesus. She pulled out some tracks and asked us to go witness to people in the emergency room and tell them about Jesus. She was worried about folks who were hurting and broken. And yet here she was, lost the love of her life. She had heart issues and would sometimes be in the grocery store and feel a heart spell coming out. She'd be pushing the cart there in the Sunflower grocery store. I think it was Bean's grocery. And then the Delta, there was a lot of Chinese grocery stores there. Uh, she was Bean's grocery, and she would just leave it. She'd feel the heart spell coming on. Then you go get in her car, drive, and lay down and realize that's it for the day. I'm going to have to rest the rest of the day. But she never let her illness stop her from serving Jesus. Uh, she would uh, go into the t rough parts of town sometimes and hand out tracts and do mission projects and uh, wasn't afraid to go serve the Lord. Uh, she'd call the church office often and offered words of encouragement and shared how much the, I was directing music and doing education in this church. She'd share how the music on Sunday had been used to be an inspiration and a blessing to her. And the State Baptist paper had an article written about folks who encourage pastors. The inspiration for the article was a picture of a tow truck 
pulling another tow truck. Okay? And the writer compared the tow truck to pastors who are used by God to help get people unstuck. And sometimes pastors need help and encouragement. Right, Brother Harry? We need some people to get us unstuck, don't we? Sometimes. And after reading the article, I immediately called Joanne and I said, I asked her, had she read the article? And she said, she had. And I said, you're the tow truck who pulls the other tow truck. I've needed you. Thank you. She was a constant source of gospel encouragement to me. And even after I left the church, I'd call her. We became Facebook friends. She'd call me. And I miss her. She's gone on to be with the Lord a few years ago. And I look forward to seeing her in the kingdom. Amen. There's another lady that powerfully impacted me. And that is my Aunt Ethel McElwain. You'll see there. She ran a little uh, country store. You see the old uh, type of uh, yes. fuel pumps there? <laughs> now, she later did get the bigger, more square ones. But... Uh, that's her son, Eddie, who's in his mid-60s. Now, my Aunt Ethel passed away when I was a senior in high school. She owned this uh, country store in southwest Alabama. She was my childhood Sunday school teacher and had a profound influence upon me. Uh, it's been about a year or so ago. Some of us were on Facebook uh, talking about, I think maybe this picture had been shared, and we began to comment that we remembered her taking us to the, you can't go there now, but it used to be you could go to the Coffeyville Lock and Dam on the Tom Bigby River, and you could watch the boats go by. And I remember she took us to see that one Sunday after church. We went and ate at a, a little uh, cafe. And she just, she just spent a lot of time with us. And she lived a very quiet, godly life. And this store, it, she used it to make her living, but she also used it to meet the needs of many poor people who needed food. And she had the respect of believers and non-believers alike. She's one of the most godly people I ever knew. I remember... Uh, and, and by the way, she was a sweet, nice lady, but, you know, she also would, if you were doing something wrong or something maybe she thought wasn't quite right, she'd talk to you about it. My mother said sometime before she passed that my dad had gone to her store, and I guess she rebuked him about something and said he got in the car and was trying to find something bad to say about her, but nothing would stick. <laughs> she lived such a godly life, it just nothing would stick. You know, it's like, it'd be a lie if I say that about her, so I just have to sit here and be mad about it and try to, uh, and she was, I'm sure she was right, okay, because she wasn't doing it to be mean, it was just, it wasn't some, he had not done something massively wrong, it was just some little area that she wanted him to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, and uh, so yeah, she was a godly lady, but there's another guy that influenced me, and he's not one that I met, but Pastor David Wilkerson, who passed away, you can't see it here, he was born May 19, uh, 1931, and uh, passed away April 27. 2011 here in the state of Texas. He actually had an automobile accident and passed away, but he's the guy who uh, wrote the books The Cross and the Switchblade. I've referred to him in the, in the past, was a, a, a crusade preacher. He founded Teen Challenge and World Challenge. Uh, a lot of the gang members in New York City were saved because of his ministry. Uh, I can't say I agree with every theological statement he made, but I do know that God powerfully used him to help me in my Christian walk. He probably doesn't agree with every theological statement I've ever made either. Okay, so, so okay, so. But one of the most powerful statements David ever made was recorded in his book, The Cross and the Switchblade. He was uh, in a, and by the way, let me just, just, just tell you how he got to there, to, to New York City. David was a simple country preacher from Pennsylvania who had a burden to go to New York and talk to some troubled youth who were being tried for murder in New York City. He'd seen their picture in Life magazine was horrified at the hopelessness of despair he saw on their faces and couldn't get over it. And after fasting and praying over the issue and sharing the burden with his church, the congregation took up an offering and drove him to New York City. So at the courthouse, he tried to talk to the judge and was confronted by the police because he didn't realize he had violated protocol for approaching the judge in their courthouse. And the judge had had some threats made on him, so the police weren't wrong in what they did. So they thought he was a crazy man who was trying to harm the judge, and they roughed him up a little bit and... Uh, he got his picture put in the paper, and uh, it was sort of embarrassing to his family and his church because this made the New York papers, you know, and, and so his picture's all over the nation, and so he still had a desire to go back to New York, and uh, his church took up a much smaller offering the next time, <laughs> just enough to keep their town, and they sent him one more time. But this time he was able to talk to some gang members and share Jesus with them, but it was his run-in with the police that allowed the young people to listen to him. They had all been in trouble with the police. So they were like, yeah, come on, talk to us. Yeah, you're the guy that's in the paper. The police roughed you up. Yeah, you can come talk to us. And it was the beginning of, of that ministry. And he ended up leaving his church and going and ministering there for years. Well, 
one of the times he was ministering, uh, he ministered to this guy named Nicky Cruz, who was a violent gang member. I mean, one of them, even the, the most hardened gang members were scared of him. He was, I believe he was probably demon possessed. He was so, so, so full of anger and all this. And uh, one of the times he ran into Nicky one night in one of the uh, apartment buildings, and Nicky Cruz says, Preacher, you come near me and I'll kill you. Here was David's response. Yeah, you could do that. You could cut me up into a thousand pieces and lay them in the street. And every piece will still love you. That blew his mind. Nikki's mind. I mean, Nikki couldn't get over that. The Holy Spirit. And, they, and these, these guys would say this. A lot of the gang members would say, Preacher, you're bugging me. And they didn't mean that he was like, but the, his, the conviction of the Holy Spirit was upon them. And sometimes we've given up on people like Nikki, but, but David didn't. He knew the power of God. And really, David was saying this before he had had a lot of the kids converted. He'd only had one or two conversions at this point. It was later that they had a crusade, sort of a, a, a youth meeting a rally, and uh, Nikki and a bunch of others, his, his, his fellow members, got saved. And that was the big thing that turned it around. So David made this statement before he had had the results of a lot of them getting saved. He was by faith stating what, what he needed to do for the Lord. Right. Well, here's a, this is another person that I know. This is my grandma, Lorena McElwain. And then this is my grandpa, Bentley. You see where Bentley was named, right? Okay, that's right. Grandpa Bentley was a very beloved figure. Grandma was a beloved figure, too. Um, last year, I shared about Grandma on my Facebook page that... Um, you know, I wanted to uh, to honor her. Uh, every time I go back to my home in Alabama and visit the, the, the church of my childhood, their pastor, Brother Lester Pope, always mentions her and speaks of her because he was a young pastor then, and he about 25 years ago came back to pastor the church again. Mm -hmm. But he, he always mentions her faithfulness and support the church when he was a young pastor. Now, my grandmother was not a perfect lady. Uh, she's, like I say, pictured with Grandpa Bentley here at their 55th wedding anniversary mm -hmm. celebration. Uh, Grandma had moments of grumbling and complaining, so much so that Grandpa, who, you know, ladies you hear about years ago, all the ladies did the cooking. Uh, Grandma was most of the cakes and pies person. Grandpa cooked most of the meals. Hmm. Actually, my dad would go uh, stay with, uh, when school was out during the summer, he'd go up the, I say up the street, it was probably a quarter mile away, you know, or more, to go uh, eat lunch with another cousin, because Grandpa was out working. Grandpa would make breakfast and, and lunch, but, uh, and then supper. But Grandma could grumble and complain so much that Grandpa would leave the house and set up a cooking pit. He had this, this car shed, and there was a two-by-six that'd stick out. He took some wire and hung a pot, and he would like uh, put his uh, uh, a barbecue grill and, and get a fire up under it and just cook it and maybe boil his peas there, and he'd have his, his uh, biscuits, whatever, going in the oven. But uh, Grandma was just griping so much and complaining, he just... He just couldn't listen to that anymore, you know? So he got out of the house, and, and you laugh about that because we laugh about that today, okay? It's funny. Uh, now, Grandma loved to talk much like I do, and she could talk too much at times like I do. And uh, I'm, I'm, a grandma, I'm a grandma's son, uh, but life was never boring when you were in her presence. She never met a stranger. She was a person of strong faith and was faithful to the things of God. Last week I talked about the Brush Arbors. Well, she was a pioneer in the holiness movement when that brand of Christianity came into uh, southwest Alabama in the 1930s. She and my grandpa at that time lived on the Tom Bigby River in a place called Lenore's Landing. And uh, some of the pioneering holiness preachers uh, would swim the river and spend the night with them and uh, would stay there. They, they would make these brush arbors. Like we said, they'd take limbs and bushes and they, they'd put a little frame and they would cover over it and they would have meetings there until they could get a church built. And I lived across the road from her when I was a teenager. And uh, I would sit with her by the huge picture window and listen to her talk and tell me about the one-room schoolhouse she attended, the game she played in school. They'd play a game called cat ball, kids, where they actually took cork, wrapped string around it, which is sort of what a baseball is, really. And then they just put a cover. They didn't have a leather covering. And they would play this game called cat ball. And she loved adding numbers. She didn't like algebra very much, but she'd tell me about the one-room schoolhouse she was in. I'd bring gospel records over to play on her stereo console, and I remember her singing alto harmony on such songs as, When judgment day is drawing nigh, where shall I be? You might remember that old hymn. Uh, I would remember her doing that. I remember when, you know, when I wrote this 
last year, I remember with tears in my eyes as she met me about, told me about the night her younger brother, uh, my uncle Doc Lewis, got saved and gave his life to Christ. And she said he stayed up all night after that happened reading the Gospel of John. Uh, she faithfully read her Sunday school and, and lesson and studied her Bible. And when she was too ill to attend church, she emphatically insisted that we take her tithe money to church. And she honored God with her money. And, and I'll tell you this, she also was honest about some of her regrets and failures. And expressed to me during our summer talks, where my grandpa died when I was 12. Grandma died when I was 20. And so during my teenage years, she would talk to me some and that, that, that regret was not of depression or hopelessness. It was just honest confession. And so she did have a strong faith in Christ and his saving work upon the cross for her. But, and the reason, why am I telling y'all this? Because some of you are grandparents. And you need to talk to your grandkids. Okay? You need to tell them. Be honest about where you failed like Grandma did. You know? Also share the good things. She passed on history to me. I mean, Grandma was born in 1902. Okay, so um, my grandma was born 18 years before the first radio station came on in America. Okay, so, uh, and I got to listen to her. I got, I got a lot of wisdom there. Uh, and what I'm saying is you can be that kind of saint, okay? You're a saint now. You need to do that. Okay, but if maybe, you know what, there's kids here and there's some, uh, my kids with the COVID stuff, I can't, they can't go see their grandma and grandpa. Y'all the only grandma and grandpa they got right now. Okay, that they see every week. So thank you for investing in them and the comforting, encouraging words you've shared to them since we've come to this church. You don't know how much you've ministered to them, okay, by letting them take a part in things and encouraging them. And there's going to be other kids that come and they need the same thing. Okay, I, I, want, I want to have our ball coach come and share a little testimony about what God's doing through the ball league and for you to get to know them uh, because we need to be connected with people. You say, I'm too tired, Brother Mike. I can't chase after kids anymore. Well, just sit here and love them. When they come to church, just visit with them. To ask them about their life. I remember many other saints. That a friend of mine, uh, his grandparents were alive. They'd be in their hundreds too. And I remember they would always ask me about my day or my week at school when I'd see them at church. I, I remember that about them. They, they talked to me like I was another adult. They didn't talk to me like I was some silly little kid. They, they act like they really cared, you know? So that's what it means to be a saint of God. One of the most precious memories that took place when I was in my senior year of high school in the spring of 1985, so you can figure out how old I am. Our church was in the midst of revival meetings, and at the end of one of the worship services, uh, I walked to the back of the church, and the closing prayer had been prayed. People were visiting with each other. I was back where Brother Harry was. I had me and the, the piano player were back there. And the piano player says, your grandma's getting blessed. I'm like, what's happening? I turn around and look. About third pew there would be about where these young men are sitting here. Now, people are shaking hands. It's, it's church is over. They're getting ready to leave. Her hands are raised. Tears running down. She is just worshiping God. She's not ready to go home yet. She got blessed, and she wasn't ready to leave. She, she was just shouting and praising the Lord. She was just having a good time. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. Never forget that, that grandma was worshiping God. And that's my heritage, a grandmother who worshiped God. And then here's what happened when she ended her journey on earth. That was a, a spiritual high moment for her. But she was stricken with leukemia a few years after that and spent time in the hospital getting bone marrow treatments and blood transfusions. She never complained. Many nurses admired her for her ability to withstand a high amount of pain, which... When you've had 10 kids in 20 years, I'm sure you're used to some pain. So, um, but she never complained a lot. Men, most people would come to visit her, ministers and other Christians. They'd always say that they came to cheer her up, but they'd leave being cheered by her upbeat attitude and her heart of worship. And of course, she was a Pentecostal lady, so when you'd go to pray, as soon as you'd say, Lord, we pray for a She's like, yes, thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. You know, she's praying right there with you and, uh, and worshiping God out loud. And so her prayers were always filled with shouts of thankfulness and worship. So I'm thankful for the influence that Grandma had upon me. And I share this, that you need to have that same influence upon your grandkids. But now let me share with you real quick, and this is where it impacts our youth, but it really impacts all of us. Um, share with you Lena Garcia. She's number 33. Now, Lena did not pass away. Okay, let me, she's still alive. Okay, so she's still here. These, these next two are people who are still living. I had the privilege of coaching Lena last year in upward basketball. She's 12 now, but she was 11 then. 
She was a point guard for our team. She played hard, practiced hard, and always listened to the instructions that me and the other coach there that's standing next to me uh, that we'd give her, Coach Melody. Uh, she and number 21 right there next to her were the sort of the, the team leaders. At the end of the season, our team honored them with a special gift for their leadership. And I asked Lena's mom what types of things that she liked. And I was told that Lena liked to journal and write down what she learned in her daily Bible readings. Lena lived in such a manner that I had no trouble believing that she regularly read her Bible. Her church had had a thing for youth called a Disciple Now weekend during the season. And it was on a, game, a day that we, it was like a Friday through Sunday morning. But she left the, 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 the Disciple Now, went to play with us, and went right back to it. Uh, I would consider Lena a godly young lady who gives uh, uh, all in every commitment she makes. But in saying she's a godly young lady, I'm not saying that while she was bouncing the ball that she's quoting scripture now. You know, uh, she, she, you know that she, while she did answer many of the questions during devotion time, she was a normal sixth grade girl in many ways. She was a ferocious and dedicated athlete. Uh, on the ball court, she'd set some hard screens. If you know what a screen is, that's where the, a person is like, getting in front of a defender so the, your person with the ball can go around. And she understood that. She, she sacrificed many points she could have scored to let number 21, who was taller and quicker, go around and score. She would do that. So, uh, and, and then when we would practice, uh, I, let, I had me and the other coach, Bentley, and a couple of parents, we would play against the girls. And we didn't have any mercy on them. I won't tell you all that. They, they played against adults, and we blocked their shots and defended them hard. But Lena, as sweet a girl as she was, she for some reason I ended up having to be the one to guard her. And she didn't hesitate to take that little shoulder and put it into my, my rib cage and go around me, you know. Uh, she was a tough, ferocious girl. She didn't let the fact that I was a foot and a half taller than her, maybe more than that, I don't know, it's a foot and a half taller than her, she didn't let that uh, defend, uh, 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 stop her. In our championship game, she played with pain. She had undergone some minor surgery and was taking longer to heal than we thought it would. And she played half the game and scored one of our last buckets. Genebeth, as I told you before, played a great first half. I mean, she shut the other defender down, the other girl down on offense. She was a great defender, but Genebeth got tired. She played so hard. Lena steps in and helps us uh, to keep that other team from coming back and beating us. So Lena made a profound impact upon me, young people, at 11 years old. And I was... 52 at the time I was coaching. And uh, I want to live the way Lena lives. You know, I want to emulate her attitude. You say, but Brother Mike, she should be emulating you. You're the adult. Well, yeah, I should be living that kind of life. But you young people can, can live the same kind of life that I want to emulate. I want to be a godly person who does my best for Jesus in everything I do, whether I'm playing basketball, being a father, a pastor, a dedicated follower of Jesus. So Lena might be just 12 years old, but she's a saint of God. And our sister in Christ. Right. So now one more. Let me share with you Joe, Jojo Theory. Jojo is the young man. His dad is Joseph. And that's me there. Okay. So, okay. I figured you, you know that's me. Okay. Anyway, well, I coached Jojo during the 2015-2016 season. And later coached him in 2017-18. And even got to help his dad the next year. Uh, it was while coaching Jojo during that last year that God strongly impressed upon me I needed to get back into coaching. And it was a JoJo here is one of the fastest players I've ever coached. You can see he's not real big in size, but he plays with a big heart and a big attitude. He's also a ferocious football player, and he's the youngest in his family, has been loved really well by his two older sisters. He has an older sister about 25 and one I think that's 18. So he's the baby. Uh, JoJo's in eighth grade now. And again, this was about two, two years ago. Uh, at our first practice during his fifth grade year, let me tell you what happened. It's the first, I'd coached him two years before. This was the first thing he said to me when he saw me. We were gathered around outside the, uh, the entrance to the auditorium, the gym. He comes up to me and says, Coach Mike, I got saved a few months ago. I mean, he was excited about it. He regularly displayed excitement about Jesus and would often answer the devotional questions at our practices and even if the answer wasn't exactly right, you could tell he at least was thinking in the right way about the answer. And he also lets you know that you think, well, Brother Mike, you liked him because he was one of your good players. He respected you a lot. He got everything he, he wanted. No, he didn't. And during his fifth grade year, he was our point guard. And I had to take that away from him. Uh, he was a quick guy, but his legs were faster than his hand bouncing the ball. And I remember that I had to take that, that position away from him and, and give him a different position. 
but he embraced it. He did well with it, and uh, and he learned from it. Now, it really helped, too, that Dad backed me up on that. Okay, he didn't say, you know. I remember I actually even had to holler at the boys one time, and uh, I got a little loud with them, and, and I remember Dad said, hey, guys, Coach it hollers that she loves you sometimes. He wants you to do right. And... Uh, but in addition to his dedicated athletic pursuits, he always demonstrated a desire to serve God and love others. And he has a passion for justice and seeing that others are treated fairly. Uh, Y'all, young people go through a lot. He had a classmate, and I helped him through that some that year, whose mother murdered him. And that impacted this kid in a great way. He, I remember he asked his mother, said, Mom, you would never do that with me, would you? And, 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 and not that his mother had ever exhibited anything like that, but the kids are th you know, the trauma that our kids are going through, they're impacted by that. So one of the reasons you need to get to know our younger people today is they're just going through some stuff you didn't go through when you were raised up. And they need you. They need that solidness that you have. And they need to be comforted. They need to know that there's a family, a village of God's people here, a church that loves them and will help them. So even though Jojo is young, he's one of God's called out ones. He's growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as our instrumentalists come and as uh, Lorinda comes to sing, I pray that these testimonies of these older and younger Christians encourage you to live for Jesus. Uh, the people I've mentioned, they are exemplary, but they're not perfect. I mean, these kids, Jojo could be mischievous sometimes. I had to call him down and make him behave sometimes, okay? Uh, they experience temptations. They get tired. They get discouraged. Uh, but that, that they're, that the, but the same Holy Spirit's empowering them, is empowering you. So maybe there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ, and so don't be like a church member from a previous church that. Uh, well, let me say this first: if you do know Christ, don't be like a church member from a previous church who told me he couldn't attend the men's Sunday morning prayer breakfast because he was not spiritual enough. Because let me tell you what we did at that prayer breakfast. Some of us came early and cooked breakfast. Are y'all ready? This is real. This is a real tough thing that we did. We ate breakfast. And we pray. I don't know how super spiritual you have to be to do that, but he let the devil put it in his mind that that's a super class of Christians that do that. Like, no, man, just come eat breakfast. You don't have to cook it and pray before Sunday morning. You have to get up a few, maybe an hour earlier, you know, maybe two hours earlier. But, uh, but, but you can do all things through Christ because the same spirit that got Jesus up from the dead, Romans 8, 11 says it lives in you. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you can know him too. He was a God-man who came as a baby in the manger, lived a perfect life, went to the cross and died for your sins, and rose from the dead to give life to all who call on him for salvation. So he rules in heaven, and he's coming back to physically establish his kingdom. So surrender to Jesus today. Become a saint of God. Come just as you are and serve the Lord today.